Okay, well, welcome everyone. Appreciate everybody's uh, time this morning. Uh, the committee members that are here, appreciate your setting aside this time and also our panelists, we appreciate you being here. We're really in a listening mode, uh, the whole uh, committee and Matt and I are definitely in a learning mode uh, about all the work that you all participated in previously. But we want to listen and at the end of this process, we'll try to come up with a regional governance structure recommendation that uh, hopefully everybody uh, will uh, accept. Matt, anything you want to say? Oh, just welcome everybody and thanks for being here. All right, so today we have um, the Activation and Economy Group. And so these are stakeholders that represent uh, really the users of water. And that user, user water is everything from uh, drinking water supply with Citizens Energy Group um, to Parks Departments. Um, and hopefully we've got a couple of others coming that have to do with uh, more of the business side of things. And then we have some attractions here. And so I'm gonna, um, uh, go around and ask the panelists to introduce yourselves and to keep things simple. I'll uh, nominate you. Please remember to mute yourself if you're not uh, talking, but please unmute yourself uh, when you do need to talk. So we will start with Director Broadfoot. Uh, just hit the mute button, Brad. <laughs> uh, good morning. I'm Linda Broadfoot. I'm the Director of Indy Parks. Is that all, all right. you're looking for right now? Okay. That, that's it. good for right now. And we've got two other um, Indy Park supporters uh, with us. Uh, Andre? Hello, Andre Denman, Park Planner and Greenways Manager for the city. And then Julie Jacob. Hi, I'm Julie, uh, Indy Parks Planning. All right, and then other panelists, we have uh, Connor Curry joining us. Norman Burns, President and CEO of Connor Prairie. Thank you for joining us, Norman. Um, and we have Mike Stroll. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Mike Stroll, Senior Vice President at Citizens Energy Group. And then Sarah Reed. Hello, Sarah Reed, Director of Community and Economic Development for the City of Noblesville. All right, I think those are the panelists that we have with us. Uh, oh, Ginger Davis just joined us. Ginger, could you introduce yourself when you get audio? There's Ginger. Hi, Ginger. Hi, Can you guys. introduce yourself? Um, Ginger Davis, Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District Conservation Administrator. All right, good morning, everyone. Glad that you could be here. Um, and so today is really the first hour is gonna be spent with the committee asking uh, questions to the panelists. Um, we did receive um, quite a few uh, written briefs submitted um, from people on this panel as well as um, others. And so the team has had a chance to review those over the past a few days, couple weeks. Um, and hopefully we'll have some good uh, conversations and good discussions. Uh, Sarah Buckner with Hamilton County and I are going to be kind of on mute taking notes um, and so we'll turn it over to the committee to get to get started. Anyone have a first question? I'll go ahead. This is Betsy McCaw. Um, I have been a part of the steering group that helped um, the steering group on the plan and a part of tourism tomorrow through Visit Indy. Um, have a great interest in this and I'm really excited that all of you have joined us here this morning. So thank you so much. Um, there are lots of themes throughout what you all sent us and one of them, which was also consistent with our last group was around um, creating public awareness and education to um, essentially create a sense of pride in the river that gets us greater funding, greater cooperation and a desire to remain um, sustainable, do the right things around the river as, as we think about this as an asset for the community. Of communities that you've looked at elsewhere, uh, where have you seen this work really well? And what have been the one or two key things that you think um, really benefited them, the strengths of whatever they did that we could think about here um, as we think about this go forward entity? Uh, this is Andre. Um, I'll jump in. Um, I think Portland, which has a regional governance 
um, called the Metro, um, which it encumbers a lot more than just what we're talking here. But I think that works pretty well. Uh, I'm sh I'm, it appears to work pretty well. Uh, I guess the major benefit is what's good for everyone and not specifically for just one works. I think it's the reason it works well. Uh, and of course, they've had a number of probably decades to work out all the kinks, but I'll just say that. I'll build on that question and really that answer. A lot of the responses, I think we agree that uh, there's not enough money to do this, but we also agree that we don't want to take money away from anything that we're already doing. Um, so I think regardless of who we are, where we are, I think you know, we've heard that loud and clear. And so where either in that Portland model, um, Andre, or just to, to anyone else, where are there opportunities to actually add new money to the collective pot so everyone benefits, everyone wins? I do think it comes in larger grants that perhaps individual organizations, I'm going to use mine as an example, Connor Prairie, we're capable of securing fairly large grants, but not for a regional project. We would just be one member of that. So uh, Connor Prairie wouldn't go out and, and uh, for a major corporation or any type of uh, um, federal grant or, or agency grant uh, that rely, uh, requires a regional um, governance model, we couldn't get that. So that wouldn't be in competition with the type of grants that Connor Prairie would be looking at. So I do think that that's the capability of having a regional governance model is there may be some potential uh, funds available that would not be uh, otherwise. Um, just jumping in, I think with the governor's uh, next level trails grant, I think connectivity is something that I think um, everyone would get behind and be agreeable to um, because they would be linking all of the amenities that were in the plan. So, um, I think that's something that I think there would be a lot of buy-in to figuring out how to get funding or more money for, for the connectivity to all of these elements along the river. Hope that makes sense. I have a question. Um, it's, it's someone along the same lines this is a, a number of you mentioned, and this came up in the last session of um, environmental uh, professionals working out in the environmental field is that um, there's a little bit of a worry of duplication of efforts, sort of this um, alphabet soup of organizations that already monitor portions or parts of the river. And then um, making sure that we, we can um, sort that out and sort out a hierarchy, because as it is, if you are a stakeholder or a landowner along the river, you already have a lot of government bureaucracy that you have to answer to. Um, and how this, how this could either help or hurt would be my question. Yeah, I read through, the, this is Mike from Citizens. I read through most of the written briefs and there was a pretty pervasive theme in there around bureaucracy and being able to streamline regulation and those sorts of things. So, it, you know, that's the $64,000 question is how do we avoid that? But it seems to me just having all the right stakeholders on the appropriate committees or the appropriate uh, governance organization is, is so important because then you really get a collective look at where those bureaucracies exist and how they impede development. And I think if we can start to break those down, then you've got a much better look at it. But I think you've got to have the right people at the table. Yeah, and I'm going to jump in after the after uh, Michael and add to that. Thank you, Brenda, for that um, sort of lead in. But for at least for um, in Noblesville, we've had quite a, a battle and many of you on this call have seen a photo floating around the internet recently. But, you know, even when there's one thing observed on the river, I, I can't even tell you the number of phone calls and emails I not only received, but then had to then make in order to figure out whose jurisdiction, you know, do I have jurisdiction? Does IDEM, does DNR and, and getting all of those contacts together. So 
I really do see it as if we can work on this hierarchy, a really big opportunity to be able to have that group of people meeting regularly, talking to each other, seeing each other, making decisions together. Um, and, and it really, it will be, you know, you have to create the right org chart so that we know, but a place, a one-stop shop where we could all go and get those questions answered by one group of people, I think could be huge. Um, and then, you know, again, I'm just going to pose the regional, regional conversation. So I know that it's just going to be uh, crazy to have uh, all of us working together over the same um, asset. But I feel like if we don't do that, it's, you know, water doesn't stop flowing at the end of Hamilton County. It just keeps going. And so we need to all be um, in it together and, and get that established. But I, I see it as a potential help for landowners, businesses, jurisdictions, um, all of us together if we if we can set it up right to begin with. So. Sarah, I think you said it. If we set it up right, I, I agree that there needs to be a governance model, but that does add, as Brenda said, more bureaucracy to the, to the thing. I would not want to see this regional govern, governance model have a bunch of bureaucrats in it. So it needs to be people that uh, are knowledgeable, but also representative and not, not necessarily going to bring their political, that's my fear, there's going to be political silos that's going to be brought into this, 12 of them or whatever. So we need to have people that are representative of the greater White River, not individual sections of the White River as it relates to uh, public and things like that. Yeah, and I think like um, one person that's sort of like the champion that, that has that big picture view could could go a long way if we have uh, sort of a, I don't know, leadership, I guess. So let's unpack that a little bit more. We had this conversation with the last group in environment, this balance of public accountability with kind of technical expert and then also the role of the public. And so how do you balance all of those things that you do want to, because we have heard in, in, the, in the briefs this time, we have heard that the people on this, whatever this thing looks like, should be elected officials. Um, but we're also hearing they should be knowledgeable about the river, and those two buckets aren't necessarily the same people. And so how do we uh, balance so that we do get a collective regional voice, but we're also accountable to each of our, you know, our communities? I almost see the elected officials as a steering committee group or a committee within that structure, Brad, if you're, if you're asking me my thoughts on that. Um, I feel like the more holistic approach we can get, the better. And you'll see whenever I'm speaking, I'm not just speaking for Noblesville, trying to speak for Hamilton County also, but, you know, we all tend to go back to our own, you know, the, what we know, our own jurisdictions. But um, I feel like we probably are going to want somebody that's not affiliated with just uh, one specific jurisdiction. Um, that's my thought. I think that, that's a, a good idea, Sarah. Um, I think you got to have a balance in the decision making authority between public officials and people from the private sector that are influenced or, or affected by the river because the only way you're going to get real collaboration is if there's a consensus ultimately in the decision making process and that can't happen if it's just the political entities or just the private for that matter as well because each has their own interest. And so I think if you can create a structure where there's a decision making hierarchy that involves everyone that would be really effective. And good luck with that, by the way. <laughs> well, Mike, you actually have at Citizens, one of the more interesting ones. I mean, it, of all the things that were studied during the process, um, the public trust model, the public charitable trust is not one that I, I think it's only in a couple of other places. Um, and the way Citizens is set up is very unique. Would you mind describing that? Because I think that would be helpful uh, because you have actually two boards, a trustee and a board. So how does that work? Yeah, no, I'm happy to. So it was actually uh, originally formed about 132 years ago. So it's been a model that's been sustainable. And I actually think it's unique, Betsy. I think there are a couple of other similar trusts, but nothing. Yeah, quite. I think you're right. You're right, Mike. And so the way we're structured is we have a five-member board of trustees that is a self-perpetuating board of trustees. In other words, their, their primary role, they have two primary functions. One is to appoint a board of directors, and the other is to fulfill vacancies in the trust when those uh, 
appointments become available. There are some limitations on them. They have to be residents of Marion County. Um, they get paid a grand total of 50 bucks a year uh, to serve as a trustee. Uh, but that's really their two primary functions is to fulfill vacancies and appoint a board of directors and then oversee that board of directors. The board of directors is a nine member independent board of directors that is not appointed by any governmental entity. And as you're probably aware, we don't have shareholders. So we're sort of, we're sort of a quasi organization. We're, we're both a municipality on one sense and that we borrow money in the tax exempt markets and we don't pay federal income tax, but we're also a private entity in that we, we cannot be influenced by any one political party. No mayor has an ability to appoint people to our board of directors and there's no sort of political patronage that, that happens. Um, so it's been a really interesting and sustainable model because our, our ultimate obligation as a public charitable trust is to provide benefit to the residents of Marion County. Now we do that through utility services, but we do it through many other sources as well, whether it be philanthropic com uh, contributions, volunteerism, uh, funding things that needed to be funded in the in the community, much like the White River Vision Master Plan. So it has been really good. I mean, our, our board of directors all have to reside in Marion County as well, but they're very broad based and very balanced. We have business people, we have folks that are more community oriented, um, longtime residents of Marion County with a goal on a long term vision for how we benefit Marion County. So very effective. It's been sustained a long time. It's been challenged a couple of times over the last hundred years and, and withstood those challenges as well. So yeah, it, it is an interesting and good model, Betsy. And the Town of Prairie is also a, a charitable trust. We have a foundation board of seven um, and then a museum board. So the foundation board is kind of, if you put it in a sports analogy, they're the owner of the team uh, and our museum board is, uh, uh, is the uh, kind of the general manager, if you will. And then the staff is a uh, kind of operates on the field. That that's exactly how the CIB and Visit Indy work. That's how Hamilton County Tourism works under a tourism commission. It's a government appointed board, but a private entity that carries out the obligations. Interesting. So one additional question, Mike, for you because I do know um, there have been some mayors over time that have really wanted to have control of citizens and it has somehow withstood that pressure. Um, how has it been successful in doing that? Because right over time, politicians shift, some want the power, some are seemingly for the greater good when they, so how do you, how has citizens been able to withstand and continue to work with mayors of all parties and those who have, who have been a little bit more active in wanting control? Sure. We have a really close connection with each administration that comes in because obviously the assets that, that we provide provide benefit to everyone uh, under under their leadership as well. But I think the way we've withstood um, the challenges has honestly been through the residents of Marion County who have stood up in each of those instances and said, we like this structure because it's not a political entity and because it's not providing um, benefit just to shareholders and we're not making short-term decisions that, that impact the long-term nature of the utilities. And a good example of that, honestly, is the Indianapolis Water Company when it was purchased by the city of Indianapolis. And I'm not denigrating anything that happened, but there, there was clear underinvestment in that utility over a period of a couple of administrations, just, you know, the natural sort of restrictions that happen in a political environment. And that had significant operating impact on the utilities and ultimately significant rate impact on those customers. And then once we were able to, to purchase those assets and sort of stabilize and normalize that, it's been really effective for the folks of Marion County. And so honestly, it has been each time, Betsy, that it's happened, it's been people that have stood up and sort of said, we don't want this and, and it's killed it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I've got a question sort of for the parks people, but uh, for everybody, uh, you know, the parks, you know, in, are influenced by the river or the, the parks are adjacent to the river. I guess, do you consider the river part of the park and, and the park's mission? Uh, Sam, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, as we have, 
focused in particular on Riverside and Broader Bowl, you know, spurred on in part by the White River Vision Plan, right, that, that helped us justify master planning those two spaces. Um, I think we've gotten a lot more strategic about thinking about how the river plays a role in those spaces for sure. Um, like everywhere else in our city, the parks um, spaces had turned away, you know, from the water as well. You know, most people visiting Broader Bowl Park don't know it's on the river. So, you know, the latest master planning efforts have really focused on sort of re-engaging um, like so many other people have with that space. So yeah, we're, we're I think in the same evolution that everyone else is in. We don't have any Hamilton County Parks on the call. Um, I'm gonna call on Ginger here to help me out because I know she works with them from a, from a preservation stand. I mean, not only agree with you about um, public engagement and the, the river, but also protection of the river. I know they're working on invasive species mitigation as much as they can. I know that the parks um, uh, campground at Strawtown Katawi is constantly looking um, at bank management and trying to do the right thing. But Ginger, you probably know more than I do about that. And feel free uh -huh. to speak the other way if you think they aren't. <laughs> yeah, no, I think they are working to engage the river with their property, um, looking at the resource holistically, looking at what is causing um, invasive spread and, and things along those lines. Um, and I think that's a good point to be made too, is that um, each individual park is kind of looking at their own property, um, but broadening out the vision to see what is going on on at the grander scale um, that is influencing the river and that's influencing um, the, the resource concerns that they have um, and the engagement concerns they have. Um, all of those things, I think if we can broaden this out to incorporate um, much more of the area, much more uh, what, what's influencing the river, what's coming from upstream, I think that that's how we're going to really engage the whole community as opposed to just those along the river. So. I will say too, for what it's worth, I think we've wrestled with um, balancing and I think even had our own internal debates, um, as you might imagine, uh, around sort of the types of development that make sense in different parts of the river, right? Um, and, you know, as we're about to build a beautiful building, um, knock on wood, uh, you know, on in Broderbill Park and sort of thinking of that part of the city as being a little different than what we would do in say Southwest White Park, right? Um, and so, you know, we have to be mindful of sort of development patterns, words I'm gonna use that Emily and Brad know way better than I do, but you know, be mindful of development patterns in different parts of the river as well. That downtown is different than suburban and, and, and all that and how we connect is gonna look different. Actually, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. I had written down some many of your stakeholders um, who own, who manage many miles of the river. I know our county park is 5.81 miles. Connor Prairie is a significant number of miles. All of you, um, and that balance is, you know, it's it's one part of the plan, right? It's it's one of the things that we we've, we've thought about a lot on the plan. And I Ginger Ginger noted that a little bit earlier is constantly trying to strike that balance. Does the thought of a governance committee? Would it help with that, or or do you see it? And Norman, I know you are looking similarly at developments along the river, and you're trying to be very, very cognizant, you know, about sustainability. But I would be interested in your responses on that. The question is, do we think a governance entity would be a challenge to overcome for what we need to do? Yeah, I I wrestle, and I invite Julie and Andre to to agree or disagree with me, but. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's pluses and minuses, certainly. You know, we've got these grandiose visions for hundreds of millions of dollars of improvement on just the land that we manage. And I hate that I don't know the number of miles along the river that we might manage as a parks department. I'm gonna figure that out. But, um, and the thought of another entity to go to when, you know, we're already in sort of permitting hell with some of the things we're trying to do, right, is, is, is challenging. The flip side is, you know, I've been using the White River Vision Plan to sell those master plans, right, to, to say that we're in line with this broader vision that exists for our community. So, yeah, I mean, it depends on the day. I, I don't know that I have a clear answer. Yeah, in, in Noblesville, we are actually, you know, taking the White River Vision Plan as the launching point for ourselves to look into a study. And so we do have, 
you know, obviously it's not just parks, not just planning, not just, um, you know, community involvement, but also engineering. I mean, there's that complex, you know, what can you even do if anything in certain areas? And obviously we have rural portions of Noblesville and urban portions, I'm gonna use the word urban, um, portions of our, our municipality too, that we wanna make sure, you know, we can capitalize on some room for development, you know? And so one of our challenges is, you know, our waterfront property is all in a floodplain and uh, what can we do which isn't gonna be cheap by any means to maybe do some offsite compensatory storage so that we can even develop one or two uh, parcels along the river to get some um, assessed value and some uh, action entertainment kind of stuff downtown. So for, for us, we also have that challenge. So we're bringing in engineering um, and possibly likely an engineering firm that may or may not have been involved in the White River Vision Plan um, to look at what that what we can do there and which parcels are a no-go and which parcels are a maybe um, and even putting a dollar number to the big cost of what if we did something as um, as crazy as like a flood wall what could that get us I know you know we're talking probably more than just millions of dollars in our municipality, but um, big picture wise, we, we're using this as a starting point for us. So we, we will develop even more detailed plans. Um, and I feel like as long as we're all being inclusive and inviting the, the, the players on this call and in the White River Vision Plan that I don't see it as being a, a roadblock to what we wanna do. I hopefully see it as a, as a team collaboration on getting something done. So um, that's, kind of our, our spin on that, but it's, I keep calling it the silent pillar in Noblesville, the White River is the fifth pillar um, <laughs> that never made it into the transition report. So one of the things that we're gonna focus on and you'll see um, us moving forward in that direction uh, in the next probably six months or so. I, I like that word inclusive, Sarah, because to me, Brenda, I think you, I, I don't know how you get away from this without having sort of a regional governance approach to it, it but the importance to me is the makeup of that governance authority and who the stakeholders are and how decisions are made because th this is a comprehensive deal and, and the interesting thing about this whole process so far is there is agreement among many parties that this is an asset that that is just waiting to be developed and you've got a lot of people that are in agreement with it but the devil's always in the details with respect to how decisions are made and i think if if it's an inclusive group with a, a clear decision-making hierarchy, then it's going to be more effective. If we don't do that, I think it could die a quick. So I have a question for the parks people um, as well. Um, I think we recognize that all of our political boundaries are arbitrary when it comes to the river, um, right? Like Sarah mentioned the river, Ginger mentioned the river doesn't stop, um, but that's how we, cut things up for representation. That's how we cut things up for funding, right? Um, now there are other states, other models that have something between a local park system and a state park system. So I'm thinking of Ohio's Metro Parks um, system or you know, a park district type of, of thing that doesn't replace the individual municipal systems, but kind of adds these bigger system amenities um, to it. So I'm just curious, I know Linda, you've you look very hard at funding parks because that's a, it's a huge challenge for us. Um, but others, are there, how do you feel about that type of like additional new body owning, <clears throat> owning and operating regional parks? What am I allowed to say? Um, so, <laughs> I mean, in other states, right, that's why, our inability to do that in the state of Indiana is likely one of the reasons why we are the most poorly funded urban parks department in the country, right? Um, at the risk of stating the obvious or not. Um, yeah, um, I, there, the added tax layer, right? The added funding that could come from that sort of arrangement, uh, speaking only for myself and not for anyone I work for, um, would certainly be beneficial uh, funding wise. But, you know, you got the flip side is, of course, again, you're adding another layer of governance, right? So uh, it, it's tough. It, it's just not something we're used to here either, right? We just don't work that way. 
Linda, if we added a layer, is there a layer we could remove in the process? And what, if that was the case, what would be most beneficial to remove? Yeah, I don't know that there is anything. I mean, you know, I mean, that, the or benefit. consolidated. Like, so that you don't have to go to multiple bodies, but you go to one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only thing, you know, going back to Brad's original question, maybe where you're thinking, maybe if you're thinking of regional parks or, you know, in other cities, you know, it's the city county, you know, differential. Uh, maybe you're thinking of those entities in a slightly different way. And so that if they're, again, I'm not advocating for this at all on the record, you know, um, but yeah, if there was a regional entity managing regional parks that is separate <clears throat> from city parks, right? I think that would be the only way to set that up. Because yeah, right now I wouldn't say we're mired in bureaucracy either, right? Because we are a city county agency that does streamline things quite a bit for us. I think are there for Andre or Julie? That's Andre. I think pushback might come from more not government, but more local neighborhood level. And I'm just thinking of Riverside because there's so many uh, different neighborhoods there that they would must possibly see a regional governance is taking away their say in their park. And that's just to be honest up front. So, so with that, <clears throat> and for the parks people, I'm, I'm going to loop in Sarah here. And by the way, we had Caroline uh, Mays join us with Rider State Park. Welcome. Um, are there, are there park amenities, attractions in central Indiana that we can't that we don't have, that we can't afford on our own. So I know Eagle Creek is a massive park, that's an indie park um, facility, but are there, yeah, are there things that in any individual park system, whether it's Carmel, Clay, or Fishers, or Hamilton County, or Indy Parks, or Noblesville, can't do on their own? You mean aside from funding? Well, I'm like, I'm thinking of facilities, or yeah. attractions, or, you know, are there types of parks or amenities that we don't have in Central Indiana that are missing? Brad, I had a question that's sort of related to that maybe. I don't know if that's the right place, but is the river a park in and of itself? Do we, should we think of the river as a park in and of itself? And that's why it needs a regional structure to manage it because it doesn't stop on the governmental boundaries. Well, Brad, when you said you're looping in, Sarah, I don't know if you meant me or Sarah Buckner, so. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah Reed. yes, you. Um, I would, you know, for me, if, if the question of is, is the river a park, and I, my answer would be yes in a way because it's a shared amenity by all municipalities and all citizens, residents, businesses, you know, I think that, um, one of the things that we may be missing in central Indiana, at least in Hamilton County, is more of that linear greenway connectivity kind of a park. So we talk about the river doesn't stop at jurisdictions, but um, going back to traditional planning concepts of, you know, being able to uh, see the greenway along the sides of a river or along um, a, a pretty intense transportation route, I think could be a really great way to get back to it. We have um, gaps in that, I would say, along the right river that could be uh, enhanced with, with this regional concept. Um, and I will say that, and Brenda can speak more to some of the, you know, private landowner issues that, that happened up this way. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, even from the, the planning permitting perception, I mean, and people feel like if it's adjacent to their property, it's their land and uh, they have a big ownership of that. And they don't want that taken away, but my and my job is to protect their private property rights as in planning, you know, and it's not easy to tell people what they can and can't do with their land, but it's part of preserving um, their land value, our land use concepts, um, our goals and visions as as municipalities. And so I, you know, I think there's a good balance between that. But again, I'm going to go back to communication and education and um, we've we've had issues recently about easements. People buy, you know, property, don't have any clue that there's even an easement on their property, whether it's a preservation or an access easement. They have, you know, 
zero understanding. And so if we come in and lay the hammer, that's obviously not going to work. But if we educate them and walk them through the process, and sometimes it's exhausting. Um, but I, I feel like we have, we may have a little handful of those people, but for the most part, the majority of people are going to be able to see the benefit of a regional governance structure. And it's not their entire piece of property, maybe just a little strip along the river, but um, could go a long way. I don't know if that answered your question, Brad, or if you have more after that, but. No, and I, um, I mentioned Caroline has joined us. And so Caroline, uh, the executive director of White River State Park, uh, which is a different type of state park. It's not a DNR type state park, it's its own entity. Um, so Caroline, I'm just, how do, you, how do you think about the river? Obviously you're, you're named it. If you look at the enabling legislation for the commission, it is the entire river in, in Marion County, but clearly you've got your property downtown. So how do you think about the river as a, as a park? Here I'm muted. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. There you go. I immediately noticed that. Sorry about that. Um, so it's a good question. Um, I've never thought about it like that, but as we, as you've asked the question and we're talking about it, I do the river um, as a park. We at White River State Park look at it as connected to our park. Um, <clears throat> the locations that are um, adjacent to White River State Park um, or that abut White River State Park, we look at it as part of our own park, but we also have an agreement with the, um, with the city and the city takes care of the river itself. So the cleaning of the river um, the city takes care of it, and then we take care of the land around it. And that was an agreement that was made many years ago. Whoop, we lost her. All right, hopefully, we'll, hopefully she'll come back. Any other questions while we wait? Go ahead. Uh, Brad, I just have a clarifying question. What I'm uh, trying to really get at what you were asking, Linda, about the amenities and parks and what I didn't quite understand exactly what you're trying to get at there. Well, I was I, I was trying to think, you know, if you know, we do have individual park jurisdictions that do their thing, um, and no mayor is probably gonna want to give up you know that. Um, to Andre's point, you know, there's local neighborhoods that do a lot of ownership over those parks. And so this idea that this regional entity comes in and takes over local parks probably isn't, it would be tough. Um, but are there types of parks that have a big enough you know, market for what they have that it probably makes sense that a regional entity that draws, that has an amenity that Carmel Clay doesn't have, that Hamilton County doesn't have, that any parks doesn't have, that draws from the entire central Indiana region to support. Is there a type of amenity like that that's missing from our portfolio? Yeah, okay, I see. That's helpful. Thanks. Well, it's Connor Prairie. Strawtown, Tavi, and Connor Prairie are the two I think of. You, you haven't really talk, talked about attractions, and uh, Connor Prairie is the is the largest private la uh, landholder in Hamlin County uh, left, and so uh, we I'm kind of representative of the private landholders, other than the neighborhood associations, the farms, the small landowners. They they're all going to have similar concerns. We have major concerns because we do have a master plan uh, for all the activities and an activity uh, between Fishers and and Carmel. Uh, a lot of people don't probably don't realize that we deal with four major governmental agencies. We deal with the state of Indiana and every agency that they have that's related to land and river. Uh, we deal with Hamden County as it relates to flood control, Carmel and Fishers. So as a private uh, land owner, we deal with all of those. And that's why I'm a little fearful of more bureaucratic government to add to all that unless it's gonna streamline that, which is what I think uh, uh, someone said, said earlier. Uh, but it's um, uh, there, there's no easy solution to uh, and there's no one model that's going to resolve it. 
Uh, I lived and worked in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I can tell you that Chattanooga has probably done as good a job as anybody over the last 35 years uh, of activating their river and creating river parks and probably a multi-jurisdictional uh, type of model between public-private partnerships and, and Hamlin County there, as well as the city of Chattanooga, as well as the uh, foundations uh, that support all those activities. So if there's a, another model to look at, it would probably be Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah, another way to think of that, Mike, is we've got a federal highway interstate system that the feds fund and coordinate. We've got state highways and county highways, and we've got local roads, right? And each of those serves a different purpose, and they're funded different ways. Other questions? Yeah, I had a, a question. Multiple, um, multiple reports that I read through said that it's crucial to have some easy wins um, to document um, at least in a short term um, time frame out of the gate, what would you guys classify as a short term win for your uh, your community, what you represent? I can start with that, Aaron. I mean, this is a really superficial thing, but um, we are pretty sure we'll be getting a Pulliam grant to begin the branding process, which is a little bit premature, but given um, we already have so many assets, I mean, many of you are on this, this call, the ability to already weave together what we have and create a cohesive message can really, um, we think, leapfrog us forward in that um, public engagement, and public concern category. So to me, to me, that's a, by next spring, having up a, an active and engaged portal will, will be critical in, in megaphoning out this message um, while the governance team gets its footing and gets up and running um, as far as that is concerned. But then there are other projects, I think, that are, that are already in the works, um, either at Conner Prairie or other places that I think could really be some early victories as well. We had begun doing a river district study at 116 to 146th Street we're about two thirds of the way through and we had to pull the plug because of funding, but um, it's definitely on the table to try to take that area and create a cohesive message. Um, so I think there's already, um, just, just your Federal Hill Common is, is mm -hmm. and Logan Street Bridge expansion. So, um, and I think Indianapolis has some projects as well. Maybe Emily can talk to that, but I, I think there's going to be some early victories and I agree with them. I think that's really critical. We're also about two thirds of the way through with a uh, with planning for a White River Education Center to be on the west side of our property to connect with Carmel Clay Parks and hopefully Fisher's Parks. If we get a governor's uh, next trail system for pedestrian bridge over the White River that would connect our two sides. Um, uh, but we also have um, uh, looks like we'll be receiving a Pulliam grant for a project on the east side that's going to create an Oxbow trail system uh, over two miles of trails with connectivity uh, to, to the river. So that's something we're doing privately that is, in my mind, is part of the White River Vision Plan. Even though it's part of our master plan, it's still part of the larger plan. And if we do the things on the west side and that connects with the private funds that we've got on the east side, I think that could easily be counted uh, as a win uh, for the White River Vision Plan if we, if we can pull that off. So, so if I could maybe take a slightly different approach to this, and it's, it's we're, we've got the Indiana Destination Recovery Council that is trying to make a rec recommendation to the state of Indiana on how to spend about $2 billion that it got from the federal government. Um, and a part of that is understanding recovery and shovel-ready projects. If you were to look at how communities rally together around a SEDS grant or have to have a SEDS grant to uh, obtain certain federal funding um, as a requirement. Does that does that begin to change how you look at the model? Does that have any amplification or clarification in terms of uh, and that's in a pursuit of a model? But there are some systems where people have to work together in order to qualify for something. We've been talking about the the, the layers of bureaucracy um, and the value of 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 whether that's worth it or not. Sometimes the, the carrot makes the, the structure worth uh, investing in and in otherwise. And I just thought we're in this period of time where we're talking about trans, you know, infrastructure investment and some of the, does that give any insight? Sometimes it helps to have, to dangle a big amount of money out there and say, how do you work together to go get it? Than it is to say, what do you want thrust upon you 
as a rule. Does that, does that change the conversation in any way, shape, or form? Uh, this is Andre. I think uh, going back to my comment about the local um, neighborhoods giving pushback, one of the things I believe would help with that is to say, if we if they know they're going to get improvements, meaning if they're giving up some type of say for uh, dollars, they're going to implement part of the Riverside Master Plan. I think that would be uh, helpful <clears throat> to what you're talking about. So yes, um, the carrot would be yes. You're giving. There's going to be a lot of money that's going to go to improvements that everybody can agree on, and I think the two improvements or areas, uh, just as we're saying, the water doesn't stop at the county line. Um, connectivity is something that I think everybody can buy into and also access to the river or improvements that would gain the public access to the river. So using the Monon example, the Monon goes between Marion County and Hamilton County, we all know that. And I think an improvement like that along the river, as far as we could get it, would go a long way to, um, others giving up some type of control to say yes we're going to get this type of amenity and i think also river access improvements what wherever they might be would be the other thing because the public in hamilton county could use access in marion county if they want it so hopefully i hope that makes sense because i'm driving as i'm talking <laughs> second you know, I, um, I, I just want to put a thought out there. It's kind of a question, but as we develop this governance structure, um, it seems that uh, one of the consensus amongst the groups is that all the different entities, whether it's conservation or municipalities, parks, private landowners, destinations, all need to be represented on this board. Um, so it seems like a liaison for each of those with uh, sub kind of connectiveness groups where um, you know, the parks could talk amongst themselves to determine what what needed to be brought to the governance structure, what, you know, what unified voice they could have. Um, for instance, in the conservation world, uh, we have the Indiana Conservation Partnership, which brings together a lot of those entities, the, the permitting entities, along with some of the funding sources, um, also standards and technical assistance committees. Um, to, to be able to create that network so that we could talk about uh, projects that are out there. Um, so having someone f that's a liaison to the Indiana Conservation Partnership to, to bring up concerns and questions from the governance um, board or structure, whatever it may be, seems to be um, a, a good way to approach this. So I guess my question is, uh, is that something we're considering doing? Is that how the governance structure would best be formed? And I have to jump off in about 10 minutes, so I apologize, I have another meeting. Yes. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we're asking those questions about what types of things that should do. And I think we have heard loud and clear from everyone that the providing the, the, the room, the table, is something that's um, important. And we do have about 10 minutes left in our scheduled time. Just for the team members if you've got any last questions please get them in and, and caroline's back on the call sorry we lost you but yeah, if you want to uh, complete your thought or, or i do um, <clears throat> so um i got on late and so i don't know how the whole conversation went but i heard bureaucracy and i heard regionalism um and i kind of agree with ginger and what she just said um one of the things i think we have to understand is really who has true ownership of the land and the river in that area and the, what i was going to say was at white river state park an agreement was made years ago on the federal level so we're bringing the feds into this um, with the U u.s um, army corps of engineers years ago an agreement was made where white river state park had ownership but that the city receives money from the federal government to keep the river clean and to take care of 
any major infrastructure improvements in the river outside of White River State Park, which is really interesting. But for instance, the state owns the levee. So in the last couple of years, we've been in talks with the city on allowing them to come in and work on the river at the levee um, because they are getting money to do this work, but we own the levee. So there's a lot of confusion, there was a lot of confusion on who owned what, who could do what. And so we've been trying to clear that up. And I think that as we get more and more into these conversations with these various groups, there will be groups who think that they have, have a, they have a perception that they have ownership or true um, authority to say what can be done and may not. And so just trying to fight through those perceptions and deal with who can do what, um, I think is going to be something that we'll have to do um, before we get a regional plan together or or determine who can do what along, we'll have to determine who can do what along the way. Does that make sense? Who's giving up ownership to certain parts who um, might be willing to allow an entity to come in? So that's why I was saying I agree with Ginger. And I'm so sorry that I missed the conversation. Um, because I think I'd be a lot more clear with my thoughts had I been on the whole time. Caroline, those are great thoughts. And it, it makes me think as you say that, that whoever serves in the leadership roles on this uh, governance committee, they're gonna have to be really skillful relationship builders, communicators, and people with thick skin and good vision. So uh, whoever that is, it's going to, is, the leadership is gonna be really, really important for this. Unless you're the Army Corps of Engineers where you own nothing and control everything, right? I mean, that's kind of the point of that is that. <laughs> well, can I, th I wanted to throw out just a, a couple of thoughts regarding some of this. I mean, we have, um, we do have a group, a body of government of some sorts that works on things for infrastructure, transportation, planning, and even now economic development is the MPO. And I know that, you know, when you say that people that don't want, you know, that procedure, that process to take place, but, but that, that body of government kind of allows for um, everybody to submit their applications for them to be reviewed correctly, to wage it against the whole region, to prioritize, to give data and feedback. It's made up of the boots on the ground, but also does include some of those uh, political entities, uh, elected officials that we mentioned before. So that's one extreme um, end of, you know, that we have that already existing. Um, but the other end even, and I don't know if Brenda will cheer or cringe when I say this, but, you know, the Nickel Plate Express, the Nickel Plate Trail, um, we are, we have that group that's on the other side of that where it's, it's small and a little bit less, it's regional in a different kind of way. Um, but we have worked together across boundaries, uh, Fishers and Noblesville, Hamilton County, we're working on hopefully bringing the Nickel Plate Trail up that will connect to Noblesville's Riverwalk. Um, and so, you know, I feel like there, there are some even more local groups that we can kind of look at and, and pick pieces and parts of. I do see, you know, the White River is even bigger than the MPO's uh, study area and so I think that, that it grows to be as something different than that but this happens uh, infrastructure wise already and if you look at the White River as an amenity and a piece of infrastructure we can kind of um, see where it goes from one extreme of the over you know over process portion to maybe a, a, the lower end of a you know, we have to find that middle ground. I think you guys have really touched on two significant challenges that we have here. And one is um, obviously how do you create a, a governance entity that um, can do all the various things that we're talking about in terms of generating the right kinds of funding and can uh, create an entity that over time has the right kind of operations to do whatever it is we want this particular group to do in relationship to all of the others that exist and, and touch the river today. Um, but there's a distinction between the governance entity and the operating entity. And so we've talked about various types of representation and 
Um, I think one of the challenges that we face is what representation should sit on the governance entity versus what should influence the operating body, if that makes any sense. So, you know, the governance entity can't look like Congress because we won't get anything done. Um, but we have so many stakeholders from an inclusivity standpoint that must be engaged here because um, all have very uh, credible needs and interests that um, are well-meaning and are the right kinds of interests. So any thoughts as to um, what needs to sit at the governance side versus what the operating body itself, um, how inclusive the operating body needs to be and where the influence needs to sit. That's the one observation while others are thinking about that is, and Brad brought this to my attention, you take a look at Indianapolis and its whole Unigov model, and I'm looking at something in the past and how it might give um, some thought to the future. And one of the things that I did not realize that simultaneous to the Unigov um, model was a, a, a secondary model uh, that was called Minigov, correct Brad, if, I'm, if I've got that right? And essentially, and essentially what, what as I understand it, and, and Brad gave me a Christmas gift of documents to read through that have been fascinating to watch the evolution of community thinking in this regard, it really is a book somebody should write, is that as Unigov got in, the unified got in ahead of the localized. And once the unified got in, it trumped the localized and Minigov never got in because the fiefdom had been set, if you will. And, and, to, and on the negative side of the conversations, if you take a look at the failures of Unigov, it has been the loss of the micro uh, at the benefit of the macro. And so I think that the, I think the nuance that's gonna be critical in this governance is how do you, and, and, and Andre, you have you've touched on this several times, is how does the micro and the macro work in unison um, in, in, in a form of democracy that represents the region. And there, the, the MPO was brought up and, and th that, that um, has its op opponents and, and, um, and it's got its, its advocates, it, depending on where you sit. And so I think that to, to look at how that has evolved is gonna be critically important because that evolution of thinking exists within the communities that we're talking about. So I think, it's going to be critical, and you know, at the at the micro level, it's down to the landowner, right? I mean, it comes right down to the Norman, which you're talking about, is representing the landowner, and yet the watershed is not just the the jurisdictional impact of those that are right on the water. It, it is the entire community because the, the water affects everyone. Um, you know, we we've, we've talked a lot about the the natural amenities and the beauty of it, but it is also what we drink. And, and, uh, and how we care for that is critically important for everyone. So um, I, I think that it's gonna be important that as we look at the macro model, that the micro model is the checks and balances and that people truly believe it is, and that it has the ability to impact uh, that macro level. And I think that's gonna be the challenge. Um, and we couldn't even tackle the elimination of townships when we were um, in our last crisis and everyone thought it was a good idea, but we still couldn't untangle it. And so I think that's the challenge we face. Hey Betsy, I think that's, I think that's such a great question too. I mean, um, I just think, I mean, that's a bit like I had some moments of clarity and this is why we ask all of you wonderful people to come and speak with us because, you know, the window shades are gradually opening. But I think that you hit on a, I hope some of you, at least, at least one of you on the team answer her thoughts. I think you indirectly answered them. This idea of governance versus operational, right? This sort of need for, and I, Matt was talking through that, this need for some portal to make things easier without making them more complicated, but yet giving a governance structure that has a vision and ability to carry out big ideas. I just, it's excellent. Thank you. And I'm gonna jump in because I always have something to say about processes. <laughs> so, um, you know, as a planner by trade, I know the process is just part of what we we have to do as, as residents, municipalities, businesses, um, as the keeper of the permits for everything from 
you know, an ILP to build a new building to a fence. Um, it's, it's, it's part of how we have to function. And I think the operations side, I see it almost as governance and operations. There's, there's a checks and balances amongst each other. And so operations, you know, some things, maybe not watersheds, uh, if you're getting down to that big of a level, that's still very regional and big picture. But, but if you're talking about land use or, or festivals or redevelopment, a lot of that stuff still falls to the local municipalities to regulate. And one of the, if you were reading through my comments, one of the things that, you know, we don't need um, as, as a governing body locally is, you know, someone to, to give us more regulations on top of what many people probably already feel like we have too many regulations. And so um, it, it is a big balancing act on both sides of that. But we do know we have to have this regional governance. But, you know, as, as maybe funds are dispersed and we have projects we're submitting for, we report back and those are checked as, you know, at various benchmark points. And so I, I feel like it is just a continual back and forth checks and balances, collaboration, effort, and, um, you know, it, we're not, we don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. It's already been invented, but we may be taking a spoke from one type of wheel and putting it ours and, and, you know, piecemealing together what the structure looks like. But, but I feel like a lot of that operations side of it is still local um, and could quite possibly even, you know, default back to parks um, and the municipalities for the regulations. But knowing that we don't operate on our own without, uh, you know, checking back with the governance structure on how that works. And we're, we're, we're over time, but I do want to ask Linda, um, and this, let's get to the, the, this, the tension of, of local and, and region. Um, Linda, some of our parks have the friends of groups. Um, Holiday Park is probably the preeminent example um, of that. And so you actually have local neighbors and residents almost, you know, almost taking over fundraising and programming and things like that for their parks. And um, in some ways that works beautifully, um, but in other ways you, you've got equity concerns because of the parks that have the ability um, become nicer and the parks that don't um, might suffer. And so can you, um, I know I'm asking you lots of on the record questions that are probably hard to answer on the record, but what are your thoughts about kind of that level of local control over operations? Uh, so when it works, it works, right? So um, we, you, Holiday Park is the perfect example of um, an entity, a, a friends group that has taken a leadership role in its park um, and that has built a long trusted relationship with the city. Um, you know, if, if Holiday came to me tomorrow and said, you know, if the friends of Holiday came to me tomorrow and said, hey, we wanna, we wanna fund the whole thing. I'd be like, great, you guys are amazing, let's do it. You know, other partners that maybe aren't proven entities yet, we wouldn't be so quick to um, do that with. And I would say your equity question is interesting because it, it, you can play both sides of that, right? So, so yes, Holiday, Eagle Creek, and Garfield are maybe getting additional amenities because they have these groups. The flip side is they are freeing up money in theory, at least, for the city to spend in parks that don't have that, those entities, right? I mean, you know, Friends of Holiday would say they get the short end of the stick often because we turn to them and go, you need a new roof? Can you, you know, can you guys do it? And then we can do the new roof at another facility that doesn't have that group to turn to. So um, when it is a, when it's a long historically proven partner with lots of solid sort of legal stuff in place, we're super comfortable. I mean, Tarkington's the other really good example right now, right? Where we have, we have entered into this collaborative community partnership um, with the Parks Foundation in Midtown and, and the MLK Center and said, you know, look, we're willing to try this because we know the community expectation there exceeds our ability to deliver because of staffing limitations and whatnot. So again, long time proven partners, um, lots of community buy-in. And so we've been willing to enter into that experiment. All right, with that, um, we're at time for our panelists. And so I appreciate you um, joining us. I appreciate everything that you've um, submitted.
um, in writing and said here in person today. Um, you certainly are experts in this in this topic, and um, this will not be the last time that uh, we, we ask for your, your input and your thoughts. Um, we're going to go into kind of conversation mode. You're welcome to stay um, on in listen-only mode. Um, this is being recorded, so it's public. Um, but we also know that I, we told you we need you for an hour, and so if you need to get going, um, again, thank you, and we're, we're glad that you could join us today. Um, so Matt and Sam. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate your participation, and uh, it's been really great. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. If you need me to bring a parks person next time, just let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brad, do you want us to uh, kind of kick off on a, on a wrap up conversation? Yeah, and um, conversations, you know, we heard, you know, what, what was different from the environmental group? What was the same? Uh, what, were your, what were your key takeaways uh, from, the, from the group today? Well, uh, if I could, I'll just start. I always try to figure out what, how to break something down into its simplest and then see where it goes from there. And so in, in my mind, I'm starting, or I'm believing that there is a, uh, a consistent, a consistent um, desire to have a, a regional governance authority of, of some sort. So that's a good thing. We, uh, after two, two key meetings, uh, everybody seems to be on board with that. Um, and so I'm starting to draw an organizational chart and there's at least one box that says regional governance or regional White River governance authority. <clears throat> and then somewhere below that box is um, a thousand operators. Uh, boxes that goes, that goes across. And, and, and um, and the bureaucracy and, uh, and, and the ability to streamline it is, is how to get those pulled together into a narrow brand and this group to um, give up something because the top group, the governance group is giving something down. So if Matt Carter can give 2 billion to the regional authority and let them figure out how they're gonna help the thousand people down here, we probably got something to start with. Um, and um, so I, I feel like there's starting to be a framework that's possible. It, the, uh, the part, the, it was interesting that the excitement, I, I guess I would say, as I listened to um, the tone and a few of the voices of a uh, a non-governmental structure uh, and whether it's the citizens or the or others which quite frankly it starts it almost relates back to our little business at, at, at Becknell or wherever <clears throat> we, we if we want money to do development we, we got to find somebody to give it to us and they want governance over everything that's major. In other words, they want governance over some comprehensive plan of how we're gonna do things. And it works perfectly when they have that governance, but then they give us the money to go do all the work and all the operations and they let us do it without them getting, dropping down into our operations. So if there's some way to create a structure where White River State Park and Riverside Park and the city of Noblesville and their downtown metropolitan area and the city of Indianapolis and their, and their area, they're allowed to do, they, they've done something that's consistent with an overall plan, but they, they go do what they do without somebody dropping into that 
at any point on the day-to-day -day operations, it feels like you start to get somewhere. So I'll stop with that, but uh, I just felt like a framework was almost starting to come together. And the, and the key is what Betsy had mentioned, the, the, the uh, um, governance over a master plan versus the operations of all the components and how those two interact. And, and uh, well, I'm sorry, one more. The more the, more the governance that falls, that comes from below, tr truly comes from below is where the bureaucracy and the difficulty comes. You know, something has to be abdicated up and some support has to go down. Can I just real quickly piggyback? I think that's excellent. And I, I agree with you that I feel like um, Bessie's synthesis was one of my favorite things about today, but I also heard that that conversely they could use help going through that bureaucracy, right? That they that there are already so many alphabet soups out there that you have to go through to get anything done. That having a, and is this an operational question or a governance question? I don't know, but to have someone who could either shepherd them, arbitrate, mediate, I don't know what the word is, but Yes, yeah. And Brenda, along those lines, I go back to what Matt, what you said is essentially that there is a contract, right? Essentially negotiated between you, the lender, and and uh, and the person who's receiving those funds. And the money is not is not transferred until the, the conditions are agreed upon. And so I think there is, whether it's a memorandum of understanding that you work out between in the Miami um, Conservancy model that we, uh, Brad, we've looked at, there are multiple organizations that have memorandum of understandings that are negotiated with that, that governance. Um, but there's a skill set at that higher level that brings some of those other things. And so there's a reason that you want to be there. In the, in the case of Miami, it was a flood. It was that the governance can help us navigate federal uh, and other jurisdictional authorities that not, we don't want every individual entity to have to navigate because we don't want to have to have that skill set. And so I think if you create that kind of that hierarchy of alignment, uh, that begins to kind of, like you just said, begins to fall in line. Um, and the key is going to be those memorandum of understandings. And my understanding, Brad, and you can ar articulate this better because you looked at it deeper, was those are renegotiated. The, it, actually, the local funds, there's a part of the local that funds up, um, as well as the, as the bonding authority to be able to fund down. And so there is a quid pro quo that's not just the understanding or agreement, but it's actually a flow of funds that uh, you can fund locally if it's something that you need within the region, or you can fund federally, or you can fund from the bonding authority um, if it's something that needs to be handled in that regard. And one way or another, the funding repayment mechanism can either be um, an external source of funds, or it could be the internal source that is generated by the democracy of local. Yeah. The Ohio Conservancy District is interesting. Those, that's one of the models um, in the packet that we gave you the first time that Andrea uh, Miller put together for us. Um, but the Ohio Conservancy District model, that it has a couple different buckets of things, and some are mandatory fees that are assessed, benefit fees basically, that are assessed for flood control um, projects that they work on. Um, but the newest pot of money is that they realize that they own all this land and stream bank um, for rec that is a you know is, is interesting for recreation. So they found that individual communities actually would like to contribute um, to help build these uh, facilities. And so that's a you know, in one side of them is kind of a forced on you, but the other side of them is um, what can I offer you municipality that you can't do on your own? And one of those things is the, this recreation land. I would agree with that and especially what <clears throat> echo out what Brenda said um, you know when Sarah Reed was talking she said that you know when we're we're talking about the the river downtown Noblesville who, who is the the resource that you go to you know there, there are so many um, so I think there's actually oddly enough with this uh, move there's uh, an opportunity to simplify it a little bit um, I know we're talking about how more um, hands in the pot could actually make it harder. But I think there is, there is a way to, to simplify and make it um, kind of a one-stop shop that 
is the expert that can kind of direct you out um, from there. And not only that, but I think that, I can't remember who, who was talking about it, but um, by having everybody come together, uh, there is a real opportunity to um, go after bigger grants, kind of like what Nolan was saying, um, to um, really feed into it. And it, it's definitely harder, but I think that there is um, a lot of opportunity. And you, you see that um, even outside of this um, type of setup, you know, like when this is kind of politically charged, but when we um, went after the HQ2 for Amazon, you know, that was multiple jurisdictions, entities um, that fed into uh, fed into that, but we could not have done that just as fishers, you know, just as nobles or just as, um, it was more of a regional thing. So I think that that, that outlook is definitely important. I'm still thinking about what, how big is our vision? If we think of the river as a part, how big is our vision for it? What would it be like in 20 years? You know, how, how big is that? Uh, could we recreate the White River so that it's navigable from the north to the south? In my mind, it's pretty darn big. It's, um, I mean, it's refocusing the city to be a rip, the whole region to be based on a river. I mean, you can create all sorts of, this can, this can go from small to large, but to reach its potential, if you had not only navigability or, or whatever that might look like, you've got an, a sustainable environmental resource, you've got um, awareness in the community around what the river means to it, you've got people excited about the use of it, but also the protection of it. Um, you have new development resources, economic development resources that come from it. You might have fitness and education that revolve around the river that create a more impactful um, sense of the people in the region around what uh, even exercising on the river, you provide the, the viability for that and then it, the use of it. I, I mean, I, I think it's pretty darn big if we want it to be. Um, and I, I think it's not just us, it's really more of what the community wants it to be. I think this is an opportunity to empower the community to think big about it. Um, connecting one another, connecting families, connecting neighborhoods that haven't been in the past. And Betsy, I'll just take that and put an amplifier on it. I think it's the most transformative project we've ever seen in the state of Indiana ever, ever. I think that it has the potential if we see its potential. Um, Brian, you've, you've talked about the, uh, how, how the CICF is doubling into equity we've seen in the planning how the equity of rural farmer and urban gentrified neighborhood are finding common ground and for the first time they're seeing a common alliance in the humanity of who they are that transcends the, the, the fractured democracy that we, we, we see in our state. The, I mean, the resilience, what tourism does, there are a lot of things it can't do, but one of the things it does do is tell stories and it brings people together so they can discover something different what you do in that space matters. The river has the ability for us to do all kinds of things, whether it's understanding the connection to food, the resilience of water, the importance of democracy, the difference in people, the, the, the diversity of community. I mean, it's way beyond recreational water and a park, um, and yet it includes all that. And I think if you miss that opportunity, that this is something that can make Indiana more powerfully aligned than anything that it's ever done, because it, it isn't going to ask for a pay raise, it isn't going to threaten to leave, it's not going to move to another state. It's, there, there are so many things that it has, and it's at its core nature. And, and I think, that's, I mean, I think that's, that's why it elevated at the top of our list. It's why we think it's so transformative. It's also why it is so dang tar, hard to figure out. I just read an article this morning about how bicycle bicycles are uh, people are bicycle shops are running out of bicycles. People are buying bikes at a new level, and uh, I couldn't find a bike for my child. Yeah, right. I, I saw my neighbors uh, across the street that last weekend where they were pulling out these bikes, and they're like they were trashed, and they were trying to get them fixed up because they wanted to go biking, and their kid, their grandkids wanted to go biking. They hadn't touched that, those bikes in five years, and uh, now they're like getting those bikes out of the garage. 
But we've been using this um, a colleague of mine, national colleague of mine, sent me this really great article by um, Arundhati Roy, who was a Indian novelist who wrote a very um, uh, re uh, celebrated book novel back in the 90s called The God of Small Things. But she was saying um, that every pandemic in the history of humankind has been a portal from the old world to the next world. And she goes on to say that, you know, as individual, so it's a disruptor. This isn't, you know, this, this, is, this has stopped capitalism and, and uh, you know, this has stopped all kinds of commerce all over the world. So this is an, a disruptor that we haven't seen in any of our lifetimes. And her metaphor is, okay, what, what do we pack from the old world? What do we take with us? But then let's be flexible and adaptable and pack lightly so we can create the next world into the world we really want it to be. For us at TICF, that's around equity. But this, you know, this seemed like such a big, big, big idea, and it, and it is. But we now have the advantage of actually disrupting the status quo to a pretty large extent. And now we're going to be able, everything's going to have to be rebuilt in some way. So maybe this is an opportunity to rebuild around the White River in a way that the status quo would have kept us from doing that prior to this moment. I think, I think there's an opportunity. Whenever you have disruption, you have new opportunity. And we have such a huge disruption in everything that this gives us a chance to do something new in a way that the status quo would have tried to stop us. I'm going to piggyback on Brian because I believe um, same the word transformation and this river um, and this pandemic all coming together and um, and what you said Betsy it's like this river has been here for hundreds of thousands of years and it's going to be here for hundreds of thousands of years and there's something I picked up yesterday called aerodynamic goals okay it's an it's an interesting concept and so at the top you have this incredible goal on um, the top level goal that never ever goes away. So when we're, when, we're, when we're not here anymore, this aerodynamic goals are always here. And that was something that lives for hundreds and thousands of years. So the community just keeps going, you know, as human beings keep coming through and expanding and moving over, like you said, Brian, to the new world, you know, and, and to really see that now with the kind of technology we're sitting on right now and taking advantage of that. And what it really takes is something called flux leadership. Another term I picked up from, um, um, and, and uh, using leadership that can, can flux and flow. And we talked about all day here about all the different kind of leaderships, but really building in flux into all that so that as this keeps changing, just like, you know, I, I did the White River on Mother's Day. I, I started up at Potter's Bridge, took me three and a half hours, came down to out where I am on the river, just below Connor Prairie. And I didn't see a single human being, nowhere. It took three and a half hours. And it was like eight in the morning till, you know, three and a half hours later. But, you know, it's just this pristine thing that you know, like, it's just not being used, you know? And I enjoyed it because I didn't get to be the only one there. But um, I just think that um, this pandemic is given us the opportunity to really look at this differently. So, um, and one other thing I wanted to say is when I drew this up in 2008 and talked to all the people in Hamilton County and along the segment that I, you know, lined up for my project, um, everybody was very territorial. You know, like this park department, not parks department, this parks, you know, and just listen to you guys today. I just remember thinking, how is this ever going to happen? Because every parks department was so like, well, I don't, I don't want the trail on this side of the river. I want it on that side of the river. And, you know, it was just all this stuff. And so that's what I'm pointing to is, really bring everybody to the table and educating and really talking about the river, what the river is. It's not about a territory because it flows because the river flows. So that's my two. Thank you. It was a good meeting. I think as, as we think about the governance, I, I just, I worry about a Congress. We have a lot of people that want to be part of this. And I think at the governance level, it's got to be, a relatively small group that can make the decisions needed that the governance entity needs to make and can which is really to hire the very best executive director you can possibly have 
um, because that individual needs to be able to run a, a pretty intricate and complex organization to involve all the stakeholders in the right way. Um, and so like our task at the governance level is pretty darn tricky um, because you just can't have everybody on that. And so um, representation, um, power authority just gets really, really darn hard um, at specific to a governance level, especially if we're not gonna design the whole organization under it, which we really can't. Um, but we are gonna have to make promises at some point to different groups to make sure that we are inclusive enough. And that in and of itself also gets real complex. I think that's a really good point. I, <clears throat> what I've been thinking of is not only that, but then the second step. So then who, who comes after um, the first executive director? Because then this, this governance structure is what helps secure that line of succession. So, you know, again, what you guys have been talking about, you know, I think out of the gate, we're all gonna be energized. Like, this is really cool. Um, we're, we've put all the pieces together, but then once some of us have exited out of this, how do we ensure that that, um, that structure will be maintained going forward? Yeah, and I would, I think that's, Brian, I think that's one of the things that I love about the, 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 the Indianapolis Foundation is that it is where civic-minded people leave money to a future unrestricted funds that they trust that the civic governance of the CICF will figure it out. They don't, they don't, I mean, there's almost this purity of, you don't agree with everything, but I mean, and that's what I think Mike Stroll was saying when they set up the Citizens Energy was that the self-perpetuating nature of that small governance that has, has a very clearly defined role, um, they know who perpetuates that and who destroys that. And uh, that thing has survived a hundred years and in fact was given um, additional resources uh, to move into its purview. And I know that wasn't a perfect transition. I know there are those that, uh, but if you look at the composition of the people that made up, not the operating board, but that governance board, they were uh, in large regard, not exclusively, but in large regard, the, the, the people you would point to in the community and say, they acted less as a self-interest or special interest and more as a civic uh, overarching uh, trusted entity. I mean, they were, you know, the John Krauses, the Martha Lampkins, the people, the brand names that you know that you could trust to make decisions that weren't hijacked by a special fiefdom. Um, and, and they did that well over time. And Betsy, I think that's going to be the challenge is defining what that looks like. And I suspect just as, quite frankly, just as each of you were secure to be a part of this conversation, that's the process that you get comfortable with or you don't get comfortable with in terms of how do you, um, how, how do you uh, address that authority? And I, I think we're seeing that political leadership can be hijacked. Civic leadership's harder to do that too because it's a, it's a trust that the people who, is, who ascend to that don't wanna destroy that trust. I mean, it's what makes a moderator of the SKL program or a community development that they, you can't, you apply for the job, um, you're selected by a trusted process that it's, 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 it's your Supreme Court judges. I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of a self-perpetuating um, trust, if you will. I just want to say, and I maybe ask Aaron to answer this though, I've interviewed two elected officials this week, both of whom said you have to have elected officials I agree with you, Matt, 100%. But their their theory is you will never be able to move it back to the to those people who make the decisions, and and you have to have that accountability, or it won't work. And so, whether or not we believe in what they're saying, if they say that, it already it already you know affects the the process. I'm just throwing Major, that out. Majority or minority makes a difference, though. In that, I think. It's I, no, I, I no, I agree. I I mean, it, it could be that balance is really going to be critically important. Elected officials are the worst. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I, I think that they're, um, you know, speaking from my role on, on Noblesville City Council, I, um, what I would find most important is that um, there's some uh, 
way that accountability is left into play. So um, whether that's, you know, every twice a year, someone from this governing body comes to tell council what's been going on, what, how, how the tax doll or what, whatever the, um, the revenue stream is, how, um, how they are representing them. I think that that is the, um, what I would find most important. Um, I agree that, um, especially I think, and I'm preaching to the choir with Brenda, but I think the biggest problem in Hamilton County is getting, um, not only all four cities on board, but then bringing in people from the County as well. There are, it's pulling in five different directions. And so, um, I think that it's really hard, but as long as to me, as long as there's, um, that we're brought into the, 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 the fabric somewhere, I think that is, that's most important. Aaron, I think that you've gotten to the, one of the common themes here is accountability. So why do people want elected officials on it? Because they, in part, because they want accountability back to their various jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. But there's no way to put every single jurisdiction on this governance body. And then the yep. fight to get who's on there is pretty darn hard. So how do we create credibility and the accountability for the governance entity that helps mitigate the challenge there? And we put the river in a trust. I, I really like the citizens model. I just have, mm -hmm. there's yeah. an obligation. No shareholders, no elected officials, but an obligation. And can I say that in the tourism structure model, you still, and he mentioned that you, that you get pressures and it's in 332 years, they've had challenges. Oh yeah, big ones. But in general, it works, you know, it, it's, I mean, it, it, I mean, we've been around for 30 years, had some really rough years, but for the most part, we've made it 30 years. You know what I mean? And I think 132 years is a pretty good record. Yeah, hey, everybody, are, I'll, say, uh, uh, Brad, I'll just drop one comment. And I also apologize for missing the last meeting. I had a company uh, retreat that's conflicted. So um, but my, one of my major themes from today, and it was a bit of an aha moment, which is I've just been sitting here, and a lot of this comes from my um, history with working with local governments, is why would Noblesville Parks ever agree to give any say to anyone else about what they want to do in downtown Noblesville or somewhere else or, or, or pick any jurisdiction? Um, I think it's going to be this entity's ability to raise funds separate from local governments. And so if a mayor is saying, I need to be on there, that's because the mayor is thinking they're going to have to fund it. And they're, and they're likely not going to fund anything they don't have control of. So this, the, this first, the early stages of this government entity, or, or of this governance entity, is going to need to be focused on being able to raise money outside of local jurisdictions taxes. And I think that's the, that's the case. Somebody mentioned carrot. I forget who that was, but that was my aha moment. There needs to be that carrot. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's Matt, Matt Carter with his $2 billion that got me thinking. Yeah. 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 Yeah, my only two billion would have to raid Brian's uh, endowment. <laughs> yeah. I did like that you had two billion. That yeah, uh, Matt's made the this recovery easy. task force money is all coming here. Can't we get the CARES Act to give uh, Matt two billion? I don't know. Maybe we could. Brian, my point in that is, is there's a task. There's a task force at the state that is addressing exactly that because the state doesn't want to give any of its money back to the federal government, and so they are seeking. I, shovel ready projects that can be implemented. Brad and I've had this conversation that, you know, that the White River, the unprecedented, you, you take a look at comparing, and I know they're different, but they serve a, they still serve a related purpose. Um, an interstate highway extension from Indianapolis to Evansville, if you drive it right now, is absent any economic development because it's going to take 50 years for those exits and that land um, redevelopment to occur, right? The White River is fully developed in terms of land ownership. 100% of the land is owned, and many of them by the very kinds of thing that the interstate hopes 50 years from now to have along its route to make it, um, to risk the assessed value for all the, the, the beneficiary communities that it serves. And the, the benefit of that is, it's, it's the, it is for a very unusual way, the new fields and the parks and the, the Connor Prairies and the Katewi Parks and these place-making assets that are sitting on this river already developed with expertise, with endowment, with funding mechanism, already established and mature, 
that th by stitching together the waterway, you get perhaps one of the most unprecedented opportunities you've ever had. The parallel I would make, Brian, is the cultural trail. The assets were there, you connected them, okay? And the assessed value lift was extraordinary. I, one of the things that hasn't been touched on is I think that you need to figure out to come up with some form of a TIF on everything now so that the lift is shared with the local, but also reinvested in the, in the cumulative. And I think there's yeah. something there that is an opportunity that creates both the capital stack locally that could be leveraged with federal and other opportunities you have to reinvest within that. And, and I think there's a way to do that where there's maybe it's a local TIF and a regional TIF of some variation and TIF may not an economic improvement district that, that you're, you're sharing the largesse of lift so that you're not you're not you're not taking away money from anybody you're you're saying the better we get the better you get um and you know i know the cultural trail wishes they had done that on the front side right now well there are some tips that it intersects um we tried we had those conversations we got nowhere politically but yeah. well maybe it was because it you know in many cases the tip takes entirety maybe it's a, maybe the learning on this is that it's not an entirety grab it's a partial grab it's a partial investment i wouldn't call it a grab I think something there, um, but you do need that carrot stimulus. I, I think that very clearly that's, that's what works. Yep. Where the funding comes from, obviously people don't want taxation without representation, right? So if I think a good point was made earlier that every mayor who thinks they're going to have to put money into this is going to want to be on the governance entity. But what if we're actually not taxing the cities and the towns? What if we're just taxing every individual so although they will claim that that's taking money out of a city or town it technically will not be so then you need citizen representation and that i'm not suggesting we're only getting citizen re representation but if you're getting funding from means that are not directly out of the coffers or cannibalizing the coffers of jurisdictions to start with then you're accountability is to every citizen. It is not to a specific jurisdiction. Um, and then you can work out whether or not different funding mechanisms come from jurisdictions down the road. But if you're not counting on that from the start, then that eliminates one of the reasons why people would say they have to be on it. They'll still claim they have to, and I understand that because there are many other reasons, but if we're not taking money from, then it's easier for us to say we don't owe you accountability on your money because we actually owe accountability to the region because we're getting funded by every single citizen in the region. So, so on that note, that's actually a fantastic transition to um, in, I believe in two weeks, we'll be having our final stakeholder group. And so that group will represent um, community equity um, in the region. And so we will have neighborhood representatives who are um, We'll have landowner agricultural interests. We will have the MPO. Uh, we'll have the MD Chamber, uh, groups like that all um, at the table so we can have that conversation about this balance of um, kind of regional versus, versus local representation. And so um, I hope to send you um, on Monday, I hope to send you the briefs that we have had um, submitted. We're still working on tracking down um, additional ones similar to this time. And so we'll probably come in waves to you. Um, but those, those are the groups that you'll be hearing from um, next time. And we are about 15 minutes or so over, and so I'll be respectful of your time um, and turn it over to Matt and Sam for closing. Well, I think we went it's, over because everybody's getting excited and uh, and starting to, to have some uh, a little bit of a little bit of clarity. Not a lot, but a little bit. And uh, so then that's because there's a lot of great input. So thank you all very much. Uh, for all the input and conversation today. Very good. Thank you all very much. Look forward to the next meeting. I'm going to get my surfboard out. <laughs> Enjoy. All right. Have a good holiday Great weekend. weekend. Thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, for organizing all of this and getting everybody on board. This is Thanks. big time work. Thank you.